Well, come forward. Okay. So it's a very great pleasure to uh, introduce my um, friend and colleague, Peter Garrett. Now, Peter and I go back more years than we'd, all, we'd both be probably quite, well, I would be anyway, quite terrified to remember being clinical research fellows together in Martin Ross's clinic uh, here once upon a time. But Peter's gone on to a very illustrious um, career um, and taken a particular interest in PPA, and um, he is currently Professor of Neurology and I think Director of the Dementia Research Group uh, at the Molecular and Clinical Sciences Institute at St George's, uh, where he's been for, for the past few years, um, building up a very successful group there, and is going to talk to us um, today about the Mini Linguistic State Examination. So, Peter, over to you. Thanks very much, Jason. Uh, thanks, Nikki, for inviting me. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to talk to this group. Um, I've heard of this group. Um, some of the patients who come to my clinics at uh, St. George's um, are regular attenders here. I only see one today, um, but it's a group that they all speak very warmly about. Um, and uh, so that's it. it's a pleasure uh, to be um, amongst you for the first time. As Jason said, I'll be talking about a project that I've been working on since um, since, since 2017 with funding, but uh, for a few years before that um, without funding. Uh, so there's a story behind this, which I'll, I hope to tell. Um, just to orient uh, people to uh, the clinical subject that the MLSE, or Mini Linguistic State Examination, is, uh, uh, is supposed to be part of the solution for, um, it, we, we recognize this, uh, this uh, entity of primary progressive aphasia, um, which has been around since uh, Marcel Meslum first um, observed aphasia as being the sole uh, clinical feature in people who, with, a progressive, with progressive cognitive decline, and that was back in the, uh, back in the 90, early 1980s. And since then, primary progressive aphasia, as it's still known, a very, very useful term, um, has been divided into three broad subtypes. Um, the non-fluent subtype, often referred to as NFV PPA, in which the uh, speech of the patient becomes halting or stuttering. Uh, the patient can lose command of either producing or understanding gr grammatical sentences. Um, his or her speech output can become fragmented. Um, but the, perhaps the hallmark of this condition, this subtype of the condition, is that uh, these patients, at least in the early stages, have absolutely no difficulty in understanding what is said to them. Um, by contrast, people with the non-fluent, uh, uh, the, okay, people with the, with the fluent um, uh, subtype of primary progressive aphasia, um, speak in a fluent and apparently, um, uh, apparently well-formed, apparently uh, to some extent and to some ears normal, uh, normal speech pattern, particularly in the early stages. Um, though um, with, uh, with trained ears it's, uh, and with time, it's clear that their vocabulary becomes more restricted, restricted to kind of generic rather than specific words. Um, they make uh, their a lack of ability to refer to things by single words, um, particularly sort of unusual objects like animals, certain types of animals, gives rise to this phenomenon of circumlocution. Uh, so instead of saying, uh, referring to the, a zebra as a zebra, they might refer to it as a, a stripy animal or a stripy horse-like animal. So frequent circumlocutions. Uh, an inability to understand words at, um, at, at the, the meanings of words. So they will often start to uh, ask uh, about the meanings of uh, particularly more unusual abstract words uh, in speech that they would have known before. Um, and a very typical error uh, that they make is to make regularization words uh, uh, reading, uh, errors in, in single word reading, which means that they pronounce all words as, if, as though they uh, rhyme with the most typical pronunciation. And the, um, the, the, the most commonly used example uh, 
is the word pint, which breaks the rule which is set by the words uh, that, that look like it, uh, such as mint or lint or hint. And so somebody with semantic dementia or, or fluent PPA would pronounce the word pint as pint. Um, come back to that because um, uh, it's important, uh, it becomes important in translating uh, the uh, assessment of PPA into different languages. And then more recently, um, or most recently, uh, this third variant of PPA, the logopenic group, uh, has been recognized um, as, uh, a, a, as a subgroup which is kind of has milder features of both the non-fluent and the fluent uh, subtypes, uh, characterized by a sparse um, uh, language output, a lot of word finding difficulty, occasional phonological errors, so mispronunciation of particularly polysyllabic words, um, and a particularly a difficulty with working memory, verbal working memory, which makes it difficult for them to repeat a sentence back to the tester. Um, now, these groups are important, and they're distinct. The fact that they're distinct from one another is indicated by the differences uh, that we see in their patterns of uh, cell loss on their MRI scans. Uh, so with the non-fluent, we see cell loss prominent in the left inferior frontal region, in the fluent group, in the anterior temporal regions of both hemispheres, and in the logopenic group on the left in the parietotemporal regions uh, of the left hemisphere. Um, and whilst there isn't a one-to-one -one correspondence, there seems to be a correlation between these syndromes and the underlying pathology. And that's going to be important for recognizing people who have pathologies that eventually we hope we will be able to treat um, at a biological level. So most of the non-fluents will have the, the t uh, frontotemporal dementia with tau inclusions. Most of the fluent or um, semantic variant PPAs will have FTD with TDP positive inclusions. And most of the logopenic group turn out to have uh, the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. Um, now this is uh, a, 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 to, to have got to this stage is the result of a great deal of uh, collaborative work, a lot of imaginative work, a lot of patient um, uh, studies, both at uh, clinical, um, imaging, and, um, and pathological level. But it still probably doesn't account for 100% uh, of the cases. And in other words, um, not every case of primary progressive aphasia is going to fit neatly into these fluent, non-fluent, or logopenic groups. There are, in other words, going to be a lot of mixed, there are going to be some at least mixed cases. And we need to define what these are and understand uh, what contributes to the uh, language deficit in these cases. We also need to uh, be able to um, have applicable um, and reproducible clinical criteria so that when I talk about um, a patient with non-fluent PPA, when Jason talks about a patient with non-fluent PPA, and when our friend uh, in San Francisco says that they've got a patient with non-fluent PPA, we're all talking about exactly the same thing. Another thing that has become apparent is that the clinical features of PPA overlap with other neurodegenerative pathologies, and in particular, uh, the movement, progressive movement disorders, the kind of Parkinson's-like movement disorders, corticobasal degeneration, and uh, progressive supranuclear palsy uh, certainly have been now found to have language deficits, which in some cases can precede the motor deficits. So we need to understand what the overlap of PPA with those other neurodegenerative pathologies is. We need, in order to recruit enough people to um, understand and to uh, assign people to treatment trials, we need to recruit really, really large patient cohorts you know, in the hundreds or even thousands. And this being a rare dementia type, um, uh, th this is a, a challenging thing to do. Um, moving on, uh, we also need uh, to understand at a theoretical level what is the similarity in terms of mechanisms between these uh, phenotypes of progressive aphasia and the post-stroke or classic aphasic syndromes that occur after a patient has an, a, an ischemic stroke, usually in the left hemisphere. We need a method for monitoring progression in PPA syndromes, uh, 
Um, and perhaps to sum all this up, which is why I've put it in yellow, um, it's clear that we, what we require is a rapid and reliable clinical data acquisition method which uh, has equivalents across different languages, which will allow us to recruit um, patients um, across national uh, and linguistic boundaries and thus to increase the size of our patient cohorts. Now, um, conventionally, um, in the clinic... Um, and in the, uh, that's the neurology clinic and in the neuropsychology clinic, language will be assessed uh, by doing these tests. Um, a test of picture naming will be administered where um, uh, the patient will be shown pictures of uh, various degrees of unusualness and be asked to provide the, uh, provide the word which describes it. In a word picture matching task, they'll be given an array of pictures and then told a word and asked to match the picture amongst these foils um, uh, in the array, the picture which matches the word. In sentence picture matching, they'll be given a series of cartoons which uh, show some, something happening, uh, and then they'll be given a, a sentence, and they'll be asked to choose which of the cartoons is correctly described by that sentence. Word repetition is pretty obvious. Um, a word is given, the patient repeats it back. Sentence repetition, I've already referred to. A sentence is given, the patient repeats it back. In associative knowledge, um, a patient will be given a picture um, of, let's say, a classic, the pyramids and palm trees. So a picture of a pyramid and then a palm tree and a Christmas tree. And then if they understand the concept of a palm tree and a Christmas, and a, and a Christmas tree and a pyramid, then they will see that those two are connected or associatively linked, whereas the other two aren't. So that's a good verbal, non-verbal test of, of semantic knowledge. Reading, I've already referred to, um, and writing is also a domain that can be preserved in the early stages of uh, progressive and uh, in, in the early stages of progressive fluent and non-fluent, uh, only later to decline, and could be a marker of one of these uh, movement disorders that I've spoken of. I think, though, so that, that's a, a list of the commonly used tests, but I think that for simplicity's sake, um, it makes more sense, or at least as much sense, uh, to think of uh, language breakdown in terms of the breakdown of uh, these fundamental domains of competence in, uh, in language. So in order to produce and understand language effectively, one needs, obviously, to be able to articulate, so articulation. One needs to understand the phonological rules of language uh, and words, how words are pronounced. One needs to know how words are fit together uh, in a rule-based way uh, into grammatical sentences. So we, we need to understand the rules of grammar. And perhaps also, and perhaps fundamentally, we also need to understand the meanings of words in order to make any sense um, of uh, what we're saying or what we're listening to. Now, it happens uh, that, uh, that if we uh, put the, cross these traditional uh, naming tests, sorry, traditional language tests that I just described with the uh, domains, we can see that these tests tap into uh, or are dependent on different domains of cognition. So if we look at, this is where I, I wish I had the, Pointer, but I don't. Anyway, I don't think, unless that's it. Is Oh, I thought that was going to happen. Sorry. That's it. No, it, it's not working. Anyway, um, so if we look at some of these, uh, the black area, uh, the blacked out um, squares mean that that area of language, that domain of language is, um, is dependent, um, is, is the thing that is the one thing that is, is the thing that is being tested by, uh, by that by that individual test. And you can see that there are some sentence to picture matching uh, in particular that just have, is that a working one? Only one can use this as a point. Oh, okay, cool, thank you. Just this as a point. Yes, fine, and the other one. Right. You should be able to use it now as well as a picture. Ah, okay, let me test. No, give me a second. Give you a second. Continue. 
trying to click it. Yeah, perfect. perfect. Oh, you Thanks. can use it as well. As okay, well. thank you so much. Um, so we can see that there are some uh, domains. There, it is. there are some. <laughs> there are some domains. Uh, like sentence picture matching, where you just need one domain, uh, one subtest like sentence picture match, where you just need one domain in order to solve it. In this case, the grammatical domain. Whereas we look at picture naming, um, to, to produce the name of a picture, you need well, to be able to articulate it. Yeah. Can, you keep it can, you, can you keep a dot still on the, still yeah. on the section? Uh, you, you need to be able to articulate the word. You need to understand how the word is pronounced. You don't need to know any grammar but you need to know the word meaning. So there are a number of ways in which, presented with a picture, uh, you might fail to name it correctly. Uh, similarly, with, um, with word repetition, uh, you might fail to repeat a word correctly because you can't articulate or because, you, 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 because you, your knowledge of phonology has broken down. So there's a mapping between these individual tests and between the domains of cognition. There's also a mapping, critically, between domains of cognition and the, uh, the uh, PPA syndromes that I started out by briefly describing. So PNFA, progressive non-fluent aphasia, um, shows uh, pa patients with this show deficits in articulation variably, more often in phonology and very often in grammar. But their knowledge of word meaning, as I said, it remains intact. In progressive fluent aphasia or semantic dementia, it's only semantics that breaks down in the early stages. Uh, in logopenic aphasia, uh, there's a, a milder breakdown of phonology, grammar, and semantics. So you can see that by trying to examine the domains of cognition more generally, we might be able to simplify the extent to which, uh, or the degree to which, uh, uh, language uh, L uh, language deficits or language problems can be characterized in these syndromes. So we began working on this uh, problem in um, about 2015. Um, and we started uh, putting together short batteries of uh, testing for use in clinic. And this was something that I'm sure was going on in the, uh, in the Dementia Research Center. It uh, was certainly going on in Cambridge, who we later uh, teamed up with in Manchester. But we would basically just give uh, the patient a, a brief, um, sorry, we would give the patient a brief battery consisting of a, some, some words to name, some, ar some uh, arrays to match, some words to repeat, and so on. Uh, and this was later translated into Italian, uh, where they produced a, um, a, a condensed instrument called the, uh, the SAND, or a uh, screening assessment for, um, for aphasia, screening for aphasia in neurodegenerative disease. And then we established a formal collaboration uh, with colleagues in Cambridge, Manchester, and Pavia in northern Italy, north of Milan. Uh, and eventually, with this consortium, this international bilingual consortium, we managed to secure this coveted uh, MRC uh, funding uh, to validate um, an, an MLSE, Mini Linguistic State Examination, in both English and Italian simultaneously. So we recruited a number of different cohorts, uh, most of whom were recently diagnosed uh, primary progressive aphasia patients, but also patients with these movement disorders, CBD and PPA. Uh, uh, this should be PSP, uh, primary, um, progressive supranuclear palsy. We recruited a group of patients from Manchester with post-stroke aphasia so that we could try to understand the similarities and differences between stroke aphasia and progressive aphasia. We recruited some age match controls. Um, we gave these patients uh, the uh, MLSE. Uh, the, um, we also gave them a number of already validated uh, tests, such as the uh, Boston Diagnostic Aphasia Examination, to make sure that, uh, that the MLSE was doing the same thing, testing for the same thing, and picking the same things up as the validated um, Boston was. Um, we also gave them the ACE-3. Uh, each patient had a 3T MRI under the GenFi protocol, which was developed by um, uh, the UCL group uh, to study genetically uh, genetic FTD. And we shared everything, uh, the imaging and the language and behavioral data, uh, in a database that could be accessed under data sharing agreements across all centres, Manchester, Cambridge, London, and Pavia.
Um, now, the just to go back to uh, language domains again, uh, the scoring of the MLSE relies on both the tests, the naming, the comprehension, the reading, and on the um, and on domains. And we do this by uh, scoring it in terms of uh, the errors made, rather than just totting up the total number of uh, correct responses that were given. Um, so as I said, in, in picture naming, it's possible to make semantic errors. Um, uh, so a circumlocution would be a semantic error. A near miss would be a semantic error. So um, a giraffe, uh, to call a giraffe a camel, for instance, might be a, a semantic near miss. A generic label to call um, a, an, a camel an animal. These are all semantic errors. They re represent the breakdown of knowledge and the link between knowledge and word meaning. Uh, it's also possible, however, to make a phonological error, uh, which is, for example, a, uh, which is a plausible pronunciation uh, of a usually a polysyll polysyllabic word. So a phonological uh, pronunciation of the word octopus could be something like octopus, um, whereas a distortion, the one below, would be a, a, a word which was so far removed from anything recognizable as a word that it couldn't really be repeated easily by the tester, it certainly couldn't be represented in, in, um, in, in letters. So we've got three different types of errors for picture naming. We've got uh, regularization errors in reading, which I've already touched on, but also distortion errors, uh, so words that, uh, pronunciations that can't be reproduced or repeated. Um, in word production, uh, we have uh, all word production uh, uh, tasks, we have phonological and distortion errors. And in, uh, and in production of discourse, we can see uh, patients when they talk, um, you know, using connected speech, we can see them making phonological dis uh, and distortion errors as well as syntactic errors. So these uh, recognitions of errors allow us to um, extract more information um, than uh, would, be, would be available uh, simply by using the test themselves, the test itself. Uh, as, the, as, a, as a measure of competence. Um, I don't know why I put this, uh, this slide up as well, because I've kind of originally, uh, I've kind of described it already, but we, we recognize four types of errors, a motor speech error, a phonological error, the difference between which is that, uh, is that a phonological error can be written down or repeated, whereas a motor speech error is non-word-like. Um, I've described semantic errors and uh, syntactic error is an error in either producing or understanding a grammatically correct sentence. So the MLSE in its final form, uh, this says version 3, but actually we're now up to version 4.2, um, after various refinements, uh, is presented in booklet form. Uh, so there's an A5 booklet fol folded over. And when you open it out, um, it, uh, it, 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 it opens out with a testing uh, page, a stimulus page close to the patient. This is not a patient, it's one of my research group. Um, and a, um, a, and a, a marking page, if you like, or a scoring page next to the tester, where the type of error that the patient makes is, uh, is noted down. So for instance, uh, this is the comprehension and repetition condition, where the patient is sitting uh, in front of those uh, reproductions of flowers, the tester is sitting at the bottom, and he says, repeat after me the word chrysanthemum. Uh, and um, the patient either gets it correct or makes either a phonological error, if he says something which is kind of plausible but not correct, or a motor speech error if he says something that is completely unrecognizable. Um, and if he makes one of these errors, then it's marked in one or other of these two uh, these two boxes here. And then the um, stimulus page is uncovered, and the, and the examiner says, uh, which one of these uh, objects is the chrysanthemum? Uh, and somebody with a semantic deficit, uh, or somebody who doesn't know very much about flowers or gardening, might be, find it difficult to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to select the right one. And if he doesn't, then he scores a semantic error which is marked in this box here. So repetition and comprehension. A few more of these uh, conditions. Here's picture naming. This is what the patient sees, uh, the squirrel, the pineapple, and the igloo. 
and this is what the tester sees. Please tell me the names of these items, um, and if the um, if the uh, uh, the word is um, uh, the, if the item's named correctly, then nothing is marked on this score sheet. But if um, if the uh, uh, production is distorted, uh, then he gets a cross here. If he creates a circumlocution or a semantic error of some other kind, then he'll get a cross here, a phonological here. Uh, we, we cue him uh, as well. So we say, if he can't get the... Um, all my patients aren't male, by the way. He or she can't get uh, igloo. We'll, we'll give them the first phoneme uh, and see if they can finish it off, which sometimes they can. And that's also interesting information. And then all their error types are marked and uh, totted up and put in those big boxes at the bottom. Um, here's uh, the, um, a, a, an example of how to test grammatical uh, comprehension. So we'll, we'll give them these sentences, like John was hit by Anne, and then the question, who got hurt? So you've got to be able to pass grammatically uh, the passive voice um, in that sentence to correctly say uh, that it was John who got hurt. Um, and the woman who John was speaking to was tall, this sort of complex embedded sentence, you have to be able to unpick that uh, to be able to uh, answer correctly that it was the woman who was tall rather than John. So these are examples, if you get them wrong, of grammatical errors um, and nothing else. And finally, uh, word reading, which, uh, as I said before, is a, a, a something that can pick out uh, patients with semantic dementia because they'll make these regularization errors like, call, like reading the word P-I-N-T is pint. These are all exception words. Then they're, they're, written, uh, they're written in one way and they're pronounced in another. Um, a, a semantic dementia patient might pronounce mauve as mauve, brooch as brooch, suede as sued, scarce as scarce, and gauge as gorge. And if they did all those, they would get uh, regularization errors marked on. But they could also read them in a distorted or phonologically incorrect manner. Uh, so once all those errors um, have been totted up together um, and all the conditions in the MLSE have been administered and they're all listed here as we've seen before, naming, repetition, repeat and point, uh, reading, sentence repetition, picture description, all the errors are totted up um, and they are, uh, each one is subtracted from 30, so if you make no errors you get 30 on motor speech, if you make no semantic errors you get 30 on semantics, etc., and you get a total score out of 100, which can then be dissected down into deficits within these particular grammatical syntactic, uh, sorry, grammatical, uh, phonological, articulatory, and semantic domains. Uh, and different combinations of uh, deficits within semantic domains gives a clue uh, to whether the patient has a semantic dementia, a progressive non-fluent aphasia, or a logopenic progressive aphasia. Uh, or indeed, um, uh, one of is falls into one of the mixed group, uh, as we started out by saying. So, um, in in the cohorts that we've tested so far, we've had three groups of clinically diagnosed people: one with SD, semantic dementia, a group with uh, progressive non-fluent, and a group with logopenic. And we predict that in the first group, there should be cl um, a clear. Um, prominence of semantic error types, so semantic impairment, with near normal or near normal syntax, so very few syntactic errors, um, and pretty much normal phonolo phonological and motor speech. Whereas in PNFA, uh, there would be a clear phonological and or syntactic impairment. Uh, this is out of date, actually. Um, there should be a deficit in motor speech, but normal semantics, so very few semantic errors. Whereas in LPA, uh, we would expect minor uh, occurrences of, uh, of all the different error types, except for motor speech and um, particularly poor sentence repetition. So here's what we found so far in our cohort. So if you concentrate on the clusters of bars of the patient groups, so we'll go first to semantic dementia, which kind of obeys the predictions most reliably. Here's their semantic performance. So this is 30 minus the number of semantic errors. We see it's well below any of the controls or either of the other groups, and it's also the lowest um, linguistic domain, the worst affected linguistic domain. We were quite surprised to see that there were syntactic errors as well. Um, 
uh, but the phonology and um, articulation were, were both normal. If we look at um, uh, non-fluent aphasia, uh, as predicted, the semantics are uh, much, much better than semantic, uh, than semantic dementia, uh, but there are deficits in both phonology and articulation and syntax. Whereas in LPA, with the, with the exception of semantic, uh, the semantic domain, uh, uh, th things are, um, are, are it, it's more of a mixed picture, more of a mixed picture, uh, and um, the, the deficits are somewhat more attenuated across many of the domains. So, as I said, we developed the MLSE in both English and uh, Italian, but since this, uh, since then, we've also uh, developed uh, language versions specific to uh, Castilian Spanish. We also actually have a Catalan version, which I forgot to put up here. Um, we've got an Argentinian Spanish version. I sent our um, postdoc over to uh, Johns Hopkins to test some US American speaking English people and adjust the test. So we have a US English uh, speaking version. Uh, and I had a Farsi speaking um, Iranian uh, research fellow who uh, translated the, uh, the test into Farsi, uh, which is undergoing evaluation in, um, uh, in, in Farsi speakers in Iran. So that's where we've got to with it. Um, I wanted to finish off by giving you a quick word about why we started calling it the, uh, why, why we decided to call it the MLSE. Um, most people assume that it's because um, this famous test, the MMSE, the Mini Mental State Examination, um, has be become so well established. Indeed, it has. The MMSE uh, is, uh, the, here's a, a fun fact, the MMSE is the, in 2014, the MMSE was the 17th most highly cited paper. This Falstein and Falstein um, paper uh, published in geriatric and cognitive uh, geriatric cognitive disorders uh, was the 17th most highly cited pub highly cited paper ever with uh, about 35,000 publications um, and it was a very very useful test both for screening and evaluating patients and following them up um, until that is uh, Pearson's the publishing giant um, uh, decided to buy the copyright of the MMSE off the Falsteins um, and, uh, and start charging anyone who used it £10 a, a shot. Um, and this, um, as you can imagine, has sent the citation rate for the MMSE plummeting. Um, it also either sent or was responsible for the share price of uh, um, Pearson's, uh, which is here, um, uh, shown here from 2015 until the present, uh, plummeting uh, as well by... Um, uh, by 50 percent or more um, and uh, and it also caused uh, problems in the um, it also caused, caused problems for other people whose tests had relied on the MMSE to, um, uh, to to become validated not least the Addenbrooke's cognitive evaluation because Pearson said that the subtests of the MMSE such as counting backwards in steps of seven or um, uh, naming a uh, a watch and a pencil were somehow kind of fell under the, the copyright. So the ACE had to be, the, the ACE, the Addenbrookes had to be translated uh, again from the ACE 3 into the ACE R. Um, and it, uh, interestingly, I, I was driving with my wife um, through Shoreditch High Street uh, soon after this happened uh, when we saw a, a telephone box with this advertisement for a local gym, with this uh, person standing in a gym. Uh, and the sentence, no ifs, just great buts. And it occurred to me that the, uh, that the, the sentence that's used in the MMSE, no ifs, ands, or buts, uh, may be so subject to copyright that, uh, that the people, the copywriters who, that the advertising agency who came up with this strapline may well come into conflict with them. I, as far as I know, they didn't. <laughs> but um, but uh, it was in some ways a challenge to this, uh, this really... Uh, you know, anti-collaborative and anti-scientific move on behalf of Pearson's that we ended up calling it the MLSE. So far, the lawyers haven't contacted me. The next steps in the MLSE test will be uh, field testing, you, uh, sending, the, uh, sending the test out to 
clinicians, neurologists, and cognitive neurologists uh, across the UK. We want to develop machine learning classifiers. Haven't really got time to go into that. Uh, we've got a lot of imaging, um, a lot of imaging um, uh, data to look at. Um, we, we, we want to use the MLSE to characterize the language phenotype of behavioral variant FTD, which I know has been done uh, but I, um, uh, by Jason's group, but I think it can, that work can be improved on. It's still work to do. It's still work to do. Um, uh, we want to ad adapt it for other languages, more challenging languages, and we're going to develop an app-based version of it as well. So very, very briefly, and I know I'm running out of time, uh, just like to thank the team of collaborators in London, Cambridge, Manchester, and Pavia. Uh, most of all, uh, our MRC-funded postdocs, Nicola Patel in London and Katie Peterson in Cambridge uh, for their efforts in reaching this, uh, this, this stage of the project. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take questions. So thank you so much, uh, Peter. Very, uh, in some ways, inspiring talk, and particularly the collaboration and the translation, a very, very um, major piece of work. So um, Professor Garrett's time will inevitably be limited, but I just uh, wanted to give people the opportunity to ask a few questions. So floor is floor is open. Questions for Peter. Was the uh, work triggered by um, the realization that the um, MS MMSE was inadequate, or was it triggered by the um, financial issue you alluded to? Yeah, the MMSE is a very good instrument, but it's uh, but it's most sensitive to diff, uh, to uh, changes in general cognition. So, uh, I've certainly seen people with variants of PPI, PPA who've scored 30 out of 30 on the MMSE for, for years after diagnosis. So it wasn't just um, trying to give Pearson's a bloody nose. It was, it was also for the clinical yeah. benefit. Thank you. Just wanted to say this is an observation rather than a question. Um, you said you, one of the words used that people had to repeat or um, mauve. I'm Welsh and I pronounce it mauve. <laughs> so it may be a word that. Yeah, that's, uh, so for the Welsh language, the Welsh English version, yeah. which we will be developing. Yes. And I'll bear that in mind whenever uh, <laughs> a Welsh uh, accent is made. Um, Professor Warren said I should ask you this question. Thanks, Jason. Can you say anything about the differences in the way... Is, is it simply you change the words and everything else is the same when you have another language, or do other things have to change? Uh, that's a great question. Thank you. American population, they wouldn't know what that was. Um, uh, in other languages, uh, there are a lot of differences. So if, when eventually we develop the Chinese version of the MMSE, um, we will have to take into account the fact that uh, Chinese is a tonal language and the uh, pitch uh, has um, contributed to yeah. meaning and grammar. So that's a, a very big hurdle to overcome. The slightly less major hurdle that we had to overcome in developing the Italian version was that unlike in English, Italian, uh, Italian pronunciation uh, of the written word is completely uh, consistent. There are no exception words. There are no equivalents of the word written as if it means, as if it's pronounced one way, but is actually pronounced the other way. You can look at an Italian word, and if you're an Italian speaker, you can pronounce it correctly. <coughs> However, there's one yeah. exception to that, which is stress assignment. So in Italian, the stress of a three or more syllable word is always on the last but one syllable. I say always, but there's a rule which tells you when to put it on the syllable before and when to put it on the last but one. But there's a group of words where you've got to know yeah. how to...
I work with um, uh, the people who come to Sevilla. I work with uh, Professor Kappa. And uh, his, the pronunciation of his name, most people would look at that and go, Stefano Kappa. Um, and, and applying the rules I've just mentioned, um, you, that would be correct. But actually, this is an exception word. It's pronounced Stefano Kappa. So, th so pronunciation is not entirely rule-bound uh, in, in Italian. So instead of doing exception word reading uh, for pronunciation uh, with a single syllable, we use multi-syllabic words. Uh, and indeed, patients with semantic dementia tend to put a stress on, th they would tend to say Stefano for, for Stefano. Uh, they would put the stress on the common syllable rather than the one. Okay, thank So that's okay. a long-winded answer to that question. Okay. within yeah. that culture of the thing that you're trying to test to, to yeah. put it that example yes yeah. uh, I'm not sure what uh, some uh, examples of things that would be familiar to Turkish speakers would be we haven't started working on the Turkish version yet yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. thank you um, have you any uh, have you come across any uh, occupational um, reasons why th I should suffer from this uh, because uh, in uh, my previous class um, I uh, noticed that all people were communicators and in such a way. Um, okay. I, I, think, I, I think that's a very uh, interesting and important observation. I don't think, um, I, I don't know what your, your job was, but, uh, but one of my patients was an army colonel and he had to brief his men uh, every, every day. Um, and I think that the, and that's obviously a communicating role. And I think one of the, the reasons why you might get an excess of this is because they get picked up earlier. People, you know, if some jobs involve verbal communication, then difficulty with that is going to become ob more obvious at an earlier stage uh, to the people that they're communicating with, to somebody who may, maybe sits at a desk or, or does graphical or so I think yes, communication, but it's not cause and effect. It's it's that the uh, the the act of communicating itself gives away the deficit in, at an earlier stage. Okay, thank you. One of the motivations for developing the MLSE uh, was uh, as a means of uh, exploring the, or as a means of measuring the uh, change that occurs in language uh, in people with, uh, with these syndromes. Um, I think that is going to be essential uh, for testing treatment. But uh, so far we've found that uh, that is also of extreme interest and possibly biological importance uh, to be able to pinpoint those people who progress very, very, very slowly 
question that we're always asked is, how, how is this going to get worse? And if so, over what time period? We can't answer that question yet, but I think that, that, this, uh, that this instrument may well give us insights into be able, being able to predict, which will be, help us to predict which group, the fast uh, or the slow, or the, you know, the medium uh, group we, that each individual will fall into. But thanks for the question. Following on from what the lady said over there about her Turkish um, patient and the, the word chrysanthemum in, in particular, I, it did occur to me when I saw that, that it, I mean, there, there must be loads of people, my husband probably in, as well, amongst those, who wouldn't know chrysanthemum if it jumped up and bit him, even when, it, when he was 20. Yes. So how would, you know, something more, something more easily recognizable or something like I me mean, the daffodil he'd have known but he wouldn't know because anthemum sure Thank so you. it was just i agree i think that when we were deciding which i mean the chrysanthemum is probably the most difficult yeah of those of the examples that i mean he was a uh, part of a a, a, t um, a test or trial in cambridge with professor Rowe, and he identified when he was put a fish was put in front of him he identified it as salmon which you know he but and he's got you know, specific knowledge in certain areas because he knows about food, he knows about fish, but not about flowers. <laughs> yeah. As I said, um, the, the, I think the chrysanthemum is probably the, yeah. the most difficult of the uh, selection of um, word comprehension uh, items that we get. Yeah. Um, we, in, in devising a test like this, you, you have to make sure that you don't make the test so easy that everyone would get it. Because if you, if you do that, if everyone in the general population would get it, you'd also miss the very mild cases of progressive aphasia who haven't yet quite got bad enough yet to be able to uh, to, to be able to fail or to, to fail on those very easy tasks. Well, that was going to be yeah the so-called ceiling effect. That but of, but of course I mean, you must also avoid Bohr effect. Right? If you make it too difficult, then you confuse the normal the normal people with the or the controls with the with, with the patients. Well, that was going to be my sort of on yeah. that. The uh, my other question was going to be: How do you identify people who are extremely articulate in tests like that? Who well, the, the you know, sort of, they, you might not, you might miss their deficit yes. because they're so highly articulate in the first place. Well, that's why you have to make it difficult. Yeah, so yeah, that's why you need a chrysanthemum. <laughs> things like chrysanthemum. Yeah. yeah. It's a very important Certainly, as a clinical tool, um, in places where imaging isn't as easily available as it is in, in London or the UK, uh, the, the MLSE uh, will be a way of uh, getting sort of pushing the diagnostic process forward before imaging is obtained. website, Chris, for, for people to log on to to give online feedback. No, we know. No, there isn't. Okay, we may yeah. have to develop that in the future. The next meeting will be the 12th of February. I think I'm right there. Um, Anna Faulkner and Rosemary Carson will lead, will lead that, that meeting. We look forward to, to seeing, hopefully, as many of you as we can there again.
And the last thing I wanted to do was to thank you all so much for your support. And I do hope that you found the meeting useful. Um, it is an opportunity to bring people together, probably the major uh, reason for holding these meetings. So they need to be useful for you. So we definitely do want to know how we can hopefully make them better in future. And the last thing I wanted to say, as we always do, was to put in a, a plug to say, both a thanks and a plug, to say we, we're most grateful to you all for your help and support with our research, but we can always do with more willing and intrepid volunteers who might wish to come forward both to be people with PPA, living with PPA, or people who might may wish to be healthy yeah. comparison subjects. And Chris and his team are running a lot of our PPA research uh, not far from where we're sitting at the moment. We'd definitely like to hear from you. Thank you all very much.